of my treasures in that home above. Trusting fully, trusting in the Savior's love. Doing what I can for heaven's holy dove. I'm getting ready to leave this world. Getting ready to leave this world. Getting ready for the gates of pearl. Keeping my record bright, watching both day and night. I'm getting ready to leave this sinful world. Trusting in the riches of His saving grace. In each earthly trial I His love can trace. Sure that up in heaven I shall find a place. I'm getting ready to leave this world. Getting ready to leave this world. Getting ready for the gates of pearl. Keeping my record bright, watching both day and night. And Jesus said, I'll go. If it were not true, I would have told you so. Just a little while to linger here below. I'm getting ready to leave this world. Getting ready to leave this world. Getting ready for the gates of pearl. Keeping my record bright, watching both day and night. And so am I. <laughs> Amen. I look forward to the day we can get off this old world and uh, get out of here and get home to be with the Lord. All right, Genesis uh, 26, if you would. Genesis 26, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, but we're actually going to be looking at most of this chapter tonight. Uh, we'll uh, be as quick as we possibly can uh, as we take a look here at the uh, 26th chapter of Genesis. Uh, so that we can get you out of here at a decent time tonight. Uh, Genesis 26, if you would, we'll stand to our feet. Genesis chapter 26, and uh, we will begin in verse 1. Genesis chapter 26, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> All right, the Bible says, And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land I shall tell thee of. Now, if you have been through most of the uh, uh, Genesis series that we've been going through, that's going to begin to sound a little familiar to you. Uh, because that's exactly the same thing that his daddy did uh, uh, about 20 some odd years or 30 some odd years before uh, Abraham did the same exact thing you ever heard that saying like mother like daughter or like father like son uh, and uh, there was obviously some patterns of behavior that he learned from his dad and he followed right in his dad's footsteps uh, in this particular situation and it got him in trouble now I want you to see verse 3 he says sojourn in the land and I will be with thee and will bless thee. Now let me ask y'all a question tonight. Where did he say he would be with him and where did he say he would bless him? In the land. If he was outside of the land, if he was to go down into Egypt, if he was to go into Gerar, uh, instead of doing what the Lord said, what was he going to sacrifice? The blessings of God. The protection of God. You know, there's no safer place and no better place to be than in the will of the, uh, of the Lord. No matter whether it's where you want to be or not, but that's where the blessings are. And uh, so keep that in mind as we go through this. He says, For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. That's called the Abrahamic covenant is being reconfirmed there, if you would. In verse 4 it says, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And, it says, and, I, and he says, And I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my 
law. Be seated. Tonight we're going to take a quick look at some instructions from Isaac. Some instructions from Isaac. Um, you go through the book of Genesis up until this point, Isaac basically lives in the shadow of his father Abraham. Everything that goes on, Abraham is really the focus of it. Uh, we know Isaac and his participation in the events that took place in Genesis 22 on Mount Moriah when he went up there, willfully laid himself down uh, at the hands of his father whenever uh, the Lord said, Sacrifice thine son, thine only son, Isaac, and, uh, and all those things. But really, there's not much said about Isaac. There's not a lot that goes on with Isaac. We know about the seeking of the spouse, and we talked about that and, and the things that dealt with that. But to actually zero in on the life of Isaac does not take place until now. Now God takes a moment and, and devotes an entire chapter to one man, Isaac. And whenever God does that, when you find God doing that, um, and He takes time to devote an entire chapter of His, e of His eternal Word to an individual, you better believe there's some things we can learn from it. God's trying to get something across to you and I that we can apply to our own lives. So tonight, we're going to look at some instruction from the life of Isaac. I want to show you three things tonight that I believe we can learn from. Uh, they're not fluid. They don't piggyback off of each other. They're actual separate things that we can learn from. So number one, we can learn from Isaac's walk, his walk. Now this is found in verses 1 through 5. And there's three things about the walk of Isaac that we can learn from tonight, if you will. Uh, three things that actually influenced his walk with God. And unfortunately, he walked the wrong way. That's what we're going to find out here. So number one, it all started with a difficult problem. A difficult problem. Look down in verse 1 and notice what was going on here. The Bible says in verse 1, And there was a what? Famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. So, first of all, when we look at this difficult problem, we note that it starts with a famine. It starts with something external. There is an external circumstance, if you would, that approaches the life of Isaac that he's found himself in, and now there is a big problem in his life. There's no food, there's no water, there's no way to sustain himself, and so Isaac is in a place where there's a huge problem in his life. Was Isaac a wicked person? No. Was Isaac a lost person? No. Was Isaac an individual that loved God and lived for God as a whole? Yes. So here's what we can learn from that famine. Being saved and being right with God and being in the will of God does not keep you from having problems in this life. See, one of the things that most Christians forget is that you and I can have problems just like anybody else. Matter of fact, we might have more problems than the lost world does out there. We're a target of Satan, amen? Sometimes we're going to have problems in this life. And so if you get saved and you things are going good, and I hope they are for you tonight, okay? But understand this. Don't let problems catch you off guard because they're coming. You, you'll have family problems. You'll have financial problems. You'll have physical problems. You'll have friend problems. You're going to have all sorts of problems that can approach your life. And here's what we do. When we find ourselves in the midst of a problem, a difficulty, we have a decision. We can either walk in the Spirit or we can walk in the flesh. Here, Abra I mean, uh, Isaac does the latter of the two. Notice what he does. When the famine hits and the problems are there, he leans on the arm of flesh. Watch this in verse uh, 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first um, famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. So we see the famine, and now we see the flesh. Let me ask you a question. What on earth is a man who saw God supernaturally deliver him up on Mount Moriah who saw God do amazing and miraculous things for Abraham, who listened and learned from his father's mistakes, what is he doing in a time of famine going to a pagan lost king for help? You see, he could have leaned on the arm of God, but he leaned on the arm of flesh. 
And let me tell you, I've seen that happen too many times in the house of God. You'll have a family, an individual that has a problem in their life, and whenever that problem arises, they'll lean on the arm of flesh, on their own understanding, on their own things, on their own thoughts. They'll try to work it out. They'll go everywhere but where they should go. Where should Isaac have gone in a time of the famine? To the Lord. He should have went to the Lord. You don't find him going to the Lord here. He goes to a pagan king, a worldly lost individual for help. You know, a lot of Christians will have problems in their marriage. And then they'll go and buy a self-help book from some dude that couldn't keep his own marriage together. Are you with me? Uh, they'll have a problem with their finances. So they'll go out and get financial counseling from an individual that doesn't even tithe. Are you with me? Uh, they'll have physical problems and things like that. And instead of asking for prayer and maybe calling on the elders of the church to anoint them and, and pray over them, they'll, they'll go out and they'll seek all kinds of medical advice before they seek the face of God. Now, I'm not against doctors, but why do we stop praying and start going to them instead of praying and going to them? Right? Uh, now, I, I'm here to tell you tonight, when the problems arise, you can either lean on the arm of God or you can lean on the arm of flesh. My suggestion to you is to lean on the arm of God. Because every time somebody leaned on their own understanding, I promise you it did not work out well for them at all. So, number one, we see that his walk was influenced by a difficult problem. Number two, we also see that his walk was influenced by a divine prohibition. Look down in verse 2 now and watch what God does. See, Isaac is one of the king's kids. So God is not going to stand around and let Isaac idly go forward into sin. What was Egypt? Egypt is a picture and type of the world and sin. So Isaac begins to move towards the world. And because he's one of the king's kids, he's one of God's children, he's a saved individual, God says, I'm going to stop this or stand in the way of it and try to warn him. So watch verse 2 now. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into what? You know what that tells me? He wasn't going to stop at Gerar. Gerar was the halfway point. Gerar was the halfway point between where he was at and Egypt. And so he was not just going to Gerar. He was going all the way down into Egypt where his daddy went and got in trouble. Are you with me? And so God stops and, and says, wait a minute, you better not go down into Egypt. You better not do what you're about to do. And so we got a great picture and type of how God tries to head off of a lot of the problems in our life. He knows we're flesh, don't He? He knows we do stupid stuff. He knows we make ignorant decisions sometimes based on emotion or the flesh or our own reasoning and things like that. And when we begin to lean on the arm of flesh and we begin to look to the world for certain things, the Holy Spirit of God is going to step in and say, no, He'll warn you. And see, God loves you enough to warn you. Would you let your child walk out into a four-lane highway full of traffic uh, and run the risk of getting run over without warning them ahead of time? Maybe you wouldn't. I mean, some of y'all, I think y'all just waiting to get them out there, right? <laughs> well, maybe I would. I don't know, you know. Yes, you would. All right, let me help you out tonight. Get you on the same page. Listen, you would warn your children before they made some huge blunder. Now, if they don't listen to you, that's a different story. But the fact is you warn them. And so God warns Isaac. But let me tell you what. God does not warn those that are not His. So if you find yourself going out into sin and there's no Holy Spirit conviction over it, there's nobody knocking on your door saying, you better stop it, you better hold on. There's no whippings when you don't hold on. Then you better watch and look and examine your own salvation and see if you're even one of the king's kids or not. Because I can tell you, once I got saved, God began to deal with me differently than I was dealt with before I got saved. So you find here a divine prohibition. The Lord steps in and says, no, Isaac, do not go down into Egypt. Number three, we find a definite promise. Um, here he switches gears now and reminds Isaac why he ought to trust in the Lord. Why he shouldn't be leaning on the arm of flesh and why he ought to lean on the arm of God. And here it is in verse 3. He says, sojourn, uh, this is Genesis 26, 3. Sojourn in this land and I will be with thee 
and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. So what is God doing here? He tells Isaac, he says, stop. Don't go out into the world. Don't go down into Egypt. And let me tell you why you ought to stop, because I've already made you some promises. I've already given you some promises that you can hang on to. And if you'll just hang on to the promises, they will come to pass. God told him, I can't let you die during the famine because I promise to bless through your seed. I promise to do some things through you, and if you die, I can't do it. So I've got to take care of you. God made him a promise. How many of you got a hold of a promise that God's made you in a time of trouble? Amen. How many of you held on to that promise until God said, I'm going to take care of business? And he did. But how many of you let go of the promise, and you went another way, and things got worse? Amen. So we learn here that there were several things that influenced the walk of Isaac. There was a difficult problem, a divine prohibition, and a definite promise. Now, let's move to the next spot in verses 6 through 11. We see his walk, but now watch his wickedness. He didn't listen, in other words. You ever had a child that did not listen? Amen. You ever, was a, you ever been a child that did not listen? All right, got a few more out of it that time. Amen. <clears throat> God told Isaac two things, and I want you to note this. Number one, he said, stay in Canaan. He said, stay in Canaan, okay? Number two, don't go to Egypt. But not once did he ever tell him to go to Gerar. Matter of fact, he started warning him when he headed that way. And so now we pick up the story in verse 6 and look out where, he, well, look where he, he, he ends up at. And Isaac, he didn't just stop in, he dwelt in Gerar. The halfway point, like I said, between... <clears throat> where God wanted him to be in Egypt. Canaan land, Gerar, Egypt. That's the way it laid out. And so he goes halfway. Now, <laughs> let's just think about this for a minute. How many times has God told us not to do something and we know over here is where we're not supposed to be, so we inch up about halfway to it. And we stay there thinking we've been obedient. <laughs> Amen. We think we've done what God told us to do. We get halfway there and we stop. And we say, okay, God, I didn't go all the way over there, but I'm going I'm to stay right here for a while. That way I can see there and I can see here. Do you realize any time you go halfway to where God does not want you to be, you're already halfway there? <laughs> I mean, let's do the math on it. And if you're already halfway there, you're just like Lot who pitched his tent towards Sodom. It's just a matter of time before you end up down there. And whenever you're disobedient to the Lord, see, God doesn't have to tell you everything, right? He don't have to tell you not to drink, does he? He don't have to tell you that because you know it's not right. He don't have to tell you not to go 80 miles an hour in a 55-mile-an-hour zone, does he? Because you know it's not right. So God didn't have to tell him to not stop in Gerar. All he had to do was tell him not to go to Egypt. Not to go to Egypt. So my point is this. I believe some of you are about halfway there tonight. You're halfway there. You, you are getting closer and closer to where God does not want you to be. And the whole time you think you're being obedient to what God told you to do. And whenever you get yourself in a situation like that, I promise you, there are going to be some dire consequences for it. Now, let me show you what happened to Isaac whenever he got halfway there. All of a sudden, let, let, let's, let's look at it like this. I love the way these people vacuum these um, carpet up here because I can make footprints in it, right? So if, if, I, if over there is where I'm not supposed to be, and I don't know if I can make footprints in this or not. I'm hoping I can. I'm going to do this so I can. Yeah, I made some footprints, right? All right, so here's halfway, okay? So right there's where I'm supposed to be. This is halfway where I'm not supposed to be, and there's where I'm not supposed to be. So you know what I did whenever I walked over here? I left some tracks. 
So what happens whenever you go halfway to where you're not supposed to be? You've got to start covering your tracks, don't you? And all of a sudden, because you know down, and if you're even saved at all, you know deep down in your heart you're not supposed to be there. You're not supposed to be even halfway there, right? And so you begin to cover your tracks so everybody thinks you're where you're supposed to be. Because if you get over there where you're not, everybody's going to know you're not where you're supposed to be, right? Okay, everybody's going to know that. So you, you, make, you go halfway, nobody really notices it, you cover your tracks so nobody finds out you're halfway to where God does not want you to be. That's exactly what Isaac did. He got halfway there, he starts to have to cover his tracks now, and so he does something that a lot of Christians do whenever they get to where they're not supposed to be, they lie. They lie about their spirituality. They lie about their walk with God. They lie about what God would be having them to do. They lie about whether they're in the will of God or not. They lie and they lie. And somebody says, do you have a problem with X, Y, and Z? Oh, no. You know what you're doing? You're covering your tracks and you're lying. And Isaac lied. I tell you what, there's a lot of Baptists that lie. They do. And, and, and you say, wait a minute, uh, you mean a saved person can lie? You got that right. Yes, they can. They can lie. And you know what? What happens whenever you lie? You have to lie more and more until you finally get right with God and come clean. You have to keep lying and lying because a lie is never stationary. It is always fluid and you always have to keep lying and keep lying. You tell another one and another one and another one and another one to try to cover up this one and that one and that one. And before long, you can't cover them no more. And, and, and so now we can learn some, uh, some really awesome lessons about lying tonight. Number one, I want you to see this, the relaying of the lie. Look down in verse 7. See if this found, sounds familiar. And the men of the place ask him, because he's in a pagan place there, and his wife was beautiful, and now um, in uh, Genesis 26-7, uh, he has to cover his tracks because he wasn't supposed to be there to start with. Now, granted, he wasn't in Egypt, but he still wasn't where he was supposed to be. And the men of the place asked him of his wife. And he said, she is my sister. Who else said that? Abraham. His daddy said the same stinking thing in the same stinking spot. Same, same exact place. His daddy did the same thing. Now watch this. <laughs> now he did it again later. Remember Abraham lied twice. Remember that? So she is my sister. For he feared to say she is my wife. Now let me say this. My Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. If you're right with God, you don't have to lie. You can be bold no matter what. But if you're not right with God, you all of the sudden... Find yourself in a place where you've got to lie and lie and lie and lie and lie to try to cover your tracks. Now, notice he says, she is my, um, for he feared to say she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca because she was fair to look upon. And so you've got the relaying of the lie. I, I read a, a quote one time that said this, a harbor of lies will always be destroyed during the storms of life. A harbor of lies will always be destroyed during the storms of life. Let me tell you, whenever you begin a life of lying, and there are some pathological uh, chronic liars that are Christians, and when you begin a life of lying, let me tell you something, storms are coming, buddy. And when they do, your lies will not hold up. You can't harbor your ship in a, in a harbor of lies because it will be destroyed. And so Isaac, because he was not right with God, began to make a refuge out of the lies that he was telling but here's the problem. You go from relaying the lie to the revealing of the lie. Watch verse 8 now. Because you can only uphold a lie for, for so long before somebody finds out. And it says, And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. And how saidst thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. Now let me just stop and say this. I don't know what they were doing, 
The Bible describes it as sporting. But whatever it was, was not a game of hopscotch. It was not patty cake, patty cake baker's man. It was not a, a game of five-card draw um, that they were sporting with. All right? Whatever it was, that Philistine king looked out there and said, they ain't a uh, brother and sister. Unless they were in West Virginia, maybe. I don't know. But nonetheless, whatever they were doing, it told on them. And he said, buddy, you lied to me. Now, I, I learned two things about this. Number one, I know this, God hates lying. He hates it. He despises lying. I don't care if it's a half lie, white lie, black lie, purple lie. It does not matter. God hates lying because God is a God of truth. Let me show you what he says about lying. Go to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. I'll tell you one thing. God can put up with a lot of stuff. The one thing he will not put up with is lying. Proverbs 6, 16. Proverbs 6.16. All right. <clears throat> the Bible says these six things doth the Lord, what? Hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Now, notice the, the, the uh, next verse here. A proud look and then a lying, what? Tongue. So God hates lying. That's the first thing you need to know. Secondly, God exposes lying. He will expose lying. God will have a grace period, as I'll show you how he had here with Isaac uh, in just a second. But God will have a grace period with lies. And if you don't come clean about that thing and get that thing right with him, he will pull the sheet back and let everybody see you're a liar. Uh, and it won't be long before it happens. Now watch Numbers 32.23, if you would. Go to Numbers 32.23. One of those warnings in the Bible tucked away back here in the Old Testament. How many of you ever got busted in a lie before? Huh? Amen? Numbers 32-23. This is Moses uh, speaking to a group of people here that had promised something, and he was basically saying, you know, if you're lying to me, look what's going to happen here. He said, but if you will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against who? The Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. And uh, this book is still true. I see it happen a lot. Now, I said that to say this. God gave Isaac a long time. Notice in verse uh, 8, and it came to pass when he had been there, what? A long time. So he gave him a grace period to get that thing right, to come clean about that thing, to confess it to the Lord. And he did it. He kept covering it up and covering it up. And so finally God said, all right, I'm going to expose that. And how embarrassing, how embarrassing it had to have been for Isaac to have to be busted on his lie in front of the king of that area. How embarrassing. And not only was it embarrassing, worse than that, it ruined his testimony. How was he going to tell that man about the Lord at that point? He didn't. He had nothing to say. He couldn't tell that man about the Lord uh, because he had been busted there. And so there's the relaying, but there's the revealing. Be sure your sin will find you out. But then there's the rebuking. Uh, go back with me to Genesis 26.10 now. The rebuking. It says, And Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done unto us? What is it that he's done? You know what Abimelech says? Uh, and if you go on to read about it there, Abimelech says, Your lie could have got us killed. And that's why God hates lying, because lying does not just influence and affect you as an individual. It hurts people around you, especially if they trusted you and believed what you were saying. And when they find out that you are lying and that that lie is revealed, they will not trust you again. And it hurts. How many of y'all have ever found out you've been lied to before by somebody you thought was telling you the truth? That hurts bad, don't it? Does it not? And so that thing, that uh, the Lord is rebuking Isaac through a pagan king because he hated lying so much there. So what, what do we learn here? We learn about his walk. We learn about his wickedness. But now watch his wells, his wells. And we're going to close out with this. We switch gears again. 
we learn a whole other lesson here. Now Isaac has gotten right, and we see a tremendous picture and type of him as he goes forward and tries to do what God wants him to do now and the resistance he faces with it. So look with me in verse 15, Genesis 26, 15. And I'll be as brief as possible. It says, For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with what? Earth. So number one, we find a problem. While Abraham, after Abraham got right in that same area under those same people, he dug uh, some wells that were there and he called them by name. And they were a place of tremendous water and, and, and sustenance and all those things. Well, after he left, now the Philistines come in and stop these wells up and so they can no longer produce the water that they were supposed to produce. And so now Isaac gets right under the same circumstances. He wants to redig the wells now. So we find him uh, uh, getting ready to redig these wells. But we need to look at a couple pictures and types because it is tremendous what this indicates about the operation and the influence that goes on inside the house of God whenever... God's trying to move forward, if you would. Uh, number one, we see Isaac. He's a picture of the born-again Christian, the true Bible-believing born-again Christian. Number two, we see the whales. They're a picture of the spiritual refreshment, if you would, that comes from several areas. Number one, the Spirit of God. Number two, the Scriptures of God. Number three, the Son of God. And number four, the salvation of God. Every one of those things I just mentioned are, are pictured as wells of water springing up that refresh you and I that are truly saved. But then there's the Philistines. They're a picture of the lost church members. The Philistines are a picture of those people within the church that are lost church members that are working against and care nothing for the spiritual aspect of church. It is a social thing for them. But spiritually, when the church begins to come alive, they can't stand it and when you begin to dig open the wells in an old dead dry dusty church and the water of God begins to flow within that church and you begin to see the Holy Spirit of God move and souls begin to get saved they want to do everything in their power because they care nothing for that to stop those wells up and then you find the earth what is the earth a picture of it is a picture of their lies, their deceit, uh, their attacks on the believers and on what God is doing inside the house of God to try to stop that and to get control of the situation. See, these Philistines in the house of God, they don't like that kind of thing because it's not within their control. They can't control what is going on anymore. When it's dead, dull, dry, They've stopped up those wells. They put their hands on them. They've got control of them. But whenever they begin to open up and somebody digs them open and all of a sudden things begin to flow again, they don't have control anymore. And so we see there the pictures. But then there's the plan. So what did Isaac do? Did he tuck his tail between his legs and run home? Did he say, I can't do this no more? Did he say, uh, uh, these are my daddy's wells. Get your hands off of them. No. I'm going to show you what he did. Look at verse 18. The Bible said, and Isaac, what? Digged again the wells of water. He dug, son. And I mean when he dug, that was a hard thing for him to do. It was hot. It was dry. Uh, there were people hawking over him, but he kept on digging. And what you're going to find here is that he had to dig four times before they left him alone. Number one, we find the first well in verses 19 and 20. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of spring of water. Notice where they were at? They were down in the valley. They were way down, as low as you could get. See, sometimes a church will get down in a valley and there's a man that will step up and want to dig open the wells of God and let that well spring up so they can get up out of that valley and get going again. And here he digs down in that valley. And the Bible says in verse 20, And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is who? We ain't never done it like that before. We ain't never seen that here before. Well, I liked it when it was quieter. This is our church. You're not going to do that in our church. Does it sound familiar? And he called the name of the well Essek. Now the word Essek means contention. So we're going to call this first well the well of contention because they strove with it. Soon as God begins to open up the well 
of, of the spiritual things inside an old, dead, dull, dry church, you're going to find some people will rise up and begin to complain and begin to gripe and begin to uh, uh, bellyache and begin to whisper behind the scenes and say, we don't want that in here. We're comfortable with this dead, dull, dry church. Then you find Isaac said, all right, watch this. And you find out here in verse 21, and they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. Uh, we're going to call this well the well of contempt. Now, an interesting side note, the word Sitna is the root, uh, the same root word for Satan. Adversary. So now he's got Satan's attention. When he didn't back down, now Satan says, hold on, I'm going to step in and do something here. And it says here that they had strove together once again. What you find here is the Philistines. They go now from griping about Isaac to hating him, to despising him, to saying we got to do something about him. we got to get this dude away from these whales. Get him out of here right now. And Satan raises up a group to begin to attack Isaac and begin to have a big standoff with him. So what does Isaac do? Isaac said, give me that stinking shovel. I'm going back to digging. And notice what he does now in verse 22. It says, and he removed from thence and digged another well. And from that they strove what? Not. Watch this. This sounds like it's great, but it's really not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth, which means room, if you would. Now, and he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. That was Isaac's take, but that wasn't their take. Let me tell you, we're going to call this the well of conniving. What they did is they said, okay, we fought with him over these two wells. Let's just take a step back. Let's let him have his way for a little bit. But whenever he's done digging this well, we're going to eventually take it over to we're going to wait around. We're going to find a different way to try to take this thing over. So they'll back off for just a little bit. Isaac thought everything was going great. What he didn't realize is they were setting him up. They were getting ready to attack him again, and he was not ever going to see it coming. And they did. But then we go to the rest of the story. There is one final well, and I want you to look over here in verse 33 now. We don't have time to cover the rest of verse 33. And then I'm going to back up and show you a couple things here. I want, to, I want to show you how this thing, I've seen this happen so many times. It is, it is so amazing, the patterns that are found in the Word of God. In verse 33, the Bible says, And he called it um, Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Sheba unto this day. What did he call Sheba? Back up to verse 32, and I'll show you. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the what? Well, which they had digged and said unto him, we have found water. And so he called it Sheba. That word Sheba means oath. It means oath. And so we're going to call this the well of covenant. The well of promise. The well of the covenant of God. And so if you will go back with me, I want to show you what happened. When he wouldn't quit, and he kept digging, and he kept digging, and he kept digging, despite the contention, despite the contempt, despite the conniving, he just kept on digging. I want you to see what this lost church crowd said about him. In verse 25, if you'll back up there, it says, And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. Down in verse 28, so they started digging there. Verse 28, here you've got the Philistines, they approach him, and here's what they say. And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. They realized when Isaac didn't quit that they were not just fighting against Isaac, they were fighting against God. They were attacking God. And I don't know what God did to them. I don't know what transpired between that third well and this well, but God wore some people out. And they stepped back and said, hold on just a minute. God's with this dude. We better leave him alone. And they made a covenant with him and said, we're not going to bother you anymore. And so now we saw certainly that the Lord was with them, verse 28. Down here in verse 31, and they rose up betimes in the morning and swear one to another. That doesn't mean swear like they cussed each other. That means they made an oath. And, I, and Isaac sent them where? Away. He said, you fellas have no business with these wells. 
This is God's. So it's time for you to go. And you know what? They were as glad to go as Isaac was to see them go. They were tired of the fighting. They were tired of that constant undertow of conflict that was going on. And the Bible says they left and departed him in peace. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged and said unto him, We have found water. Now, the water flows. As a matter of fact, those, that one well in Beersheba is still there today. You want, you want to know why? Because there was a man that was willing to fight for it. And he fought, and he fought, and he dug. Blisters, blood, and all. He would not quit, and God blessed him. Who did he turn to? He turned to the Lord. He didn't take the shovel and beat that dude in the head that was fussing at him. But he just turned to the Lord. You know something I pray before during times of conflict when I've seen this happen, and Lord knows I've seen it happen. You know what I pray? I pray, God, show whose side you're on. Just show whose side you're on. I want you to show up in a way that you show whose side you're on so that the people that love the Lord will learn to fear and the people that are causing the problems will either get right or get out. Just show whose side you're on. Because you know what? How silly it is to hold back the well. You know what the well is? The well is where we get our refreshment from. And how silly to create a dry, dead, dusty, stopped up place where you come and sit for an hour or two and go home and you're just as dry when you came in as when you left. What is the point? What is the end of that? I don't know about you. When I come to the house of God, I want to be refreshed. I want, to, I want to be just, I want to get that spiritual drink that I need. And so what's the point? I'll tell you what the point is. you got lost people fighting against God because somebody's trying to open some wells up and let God have his way. Let me tell you something. Don't be that person. Don't be in that crowd that does that kind of thing because I promise you the judgment of God comes on that crowd just like it came on this crowd in the book. Don't be that person. But let me ask you this tonight. We've learned about that walk. How many of y'all got a problem and you're so close to walking towards the world instead of staying with the Lord. You got that problem in your life tonight? Don't lean on the arm of flesh. You lean on, lean on the arm of God. And he will solve your problem. Did he solve Isaac's problem? He did. But Isaac went the wrong way, and he had to take him through some things. He came out on the other side, and he solved his problem. Don't let that be you. Come to the Lord with your problem tonight. The walk the wickedness, we don't want to do that, but the wells, we do want to have that. So would you come tonight with your problems? Do you come tonight with whatever situation is? And if you've been trying to stop up the wells here at Calvary, you come down this altar and get right tonight. If you've got so much pride you can't do that, then I can't do nothing for you. But if you'll humble yourself, God will deal with you tonight, and things will change for you, I promise you. But if you don't, you're fighting against God. You're not fighting against the church, the people, and me. So let's pray. Lord, bless this invitation tonight. Put your hand upon it. You use it however you would. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would have free reign tonight. Father God, help us, Lord, as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.